think we might make it through the rest of Psalms 91 today. We'll see what happens. I got four, four principles done last week. I'll try to get the other four today. But Psalms 91, verse 1, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare, from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. It goes on to say, His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at mid uh, midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Story told of John G. Lake, true story, when he was ministering in South Africa. He was called the Apostle of Faith. He went there really with just enough money to take himself, Thomas Hazelmack, and his family to get to South Africa. That's all the money he had. That was it. And so he went there, and you have to hear his whole story about how God had him in real estate, gave that all up, went to Azusa, got touched by the Spirit of God, filled the Holy Spirit, and then he was called to South Africa. When he pulled up on the shore, had no place to go, no money, no place to sleep, there was a lady who was directed by God, says, hey, you are John G. Lake. The Lord told you to come to my house. I have a house that is available for you and your family to stay in, rent free, no problem. They went there. Then they found a church that was empty, that was open, nobody preaching there. God opened the door. They began to minister in South Africa for the next five years. They rocked that continent with the power and the anointing of Jesus Christ. The dead were raised, the sick were made whole, phenomenal miracles that took place during his his time there in South Africa. He's known as the Apostle of Faith to South Africa. I said that to say this because there was a point in time when there was a plague going throughout South Africa. And people were dropping like flies, even in some of his churches where people were dying. He'd go to minister them and they would be dying. He'd also go to many and he'd pray for them and God would raise them up and make them whole. It was at one of these points in times that the people said, the leaders of that community says, well, how come this doesn't affect you? He says, because I believe that the moment that that virus or whatever it is that it touches my body is going to die because of the anointing and the power of God on my life. So what they did is they actually did a test. They took some of the plague that was there, they put it on his hand, they put it under a microscope, and the moment they put it in his hand, they watched that plague. Rather than, ex rather than spread, it died instantly to the glory of God. So Psalms 91 is a reality, folks, for those that believe. It goes on to say, uh, if you say, this is now verse number 9, if you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. I was talking with somebody this past week about angels. She says, I remember when I was about 19 years of age, I was involved in an automobile accident. My back of my head went through the glass, went through the windshield and came back out. And I remember I, I, had, I suffered a head injury. And she says, I was like knocked out. But I remember distinctly there were like three angels that were ministering to me. And she says, they were just standing there ministering. I can distinctly remember to this day. And she says, you know, it's an amazing thing. They didn't have wings. And I says, well, why is, why is, that? Why is that a problem? She goes, because I thought angels had wings. I says, you didn't read the Bible. Every time an angel shows up, they never have wings. See, a lot of people don't read the Bible, so they don't know what the Bible says. They just assume because, you know, touched by an angel or somebody else presents an angel with wings. I got to tell you, or like, you know, what was, the, what was the Christmas movie? You know, another something got its wings. Well, that's bogus. That sounds nice, but it's not the word. Now, seraphim and cherubim, who are types of angels and part of the angel, uh, angel hierarchy, yeah, they have wings, but most angels that show up and appear, remember Moses, remember to Abraham, remember to Daniel, they didn't have wings. They were like you and I. They were in human form. They don't have wings. Okay, so let's just settle our theology here and get it established. That really made her feel good. She goes, wow, that even makes it more you know, real to me. <laughs> Going on, it says this. Verse 12, they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You tread upon the lion and the cobra. You'll trample on the great lion and the serpent. That's demonic and Satan and his entire realm that we're going to tread upon him. Praise God for that. Can I hear an amen? amen? You all know Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. Overcome all. Everybody say all. All, all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you or hurt you. Verse 14 is where we are today. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Did you release the birds? Because I sure heard a bird chirping over there a minute. Was it above us? Is there a bird loose above us? 
You sure it's not the parakeets next door? They put those things out there every day. And one day they may be blasted by a shotgun and God might have to resurrect them. But anyway, <coughs> they're annoying. If you've ever been here during the daytime, they put these parrots out next door. <coughs> anyway. <laughs> God took care of them through me. All right, eight points that I talked about, four of them last week regarding the subject entitled Premium Benefits. Uh, our series is entitled Total Security. This message is Premium Benefits. This is part two of that message, but last week I talked about rescued. In other words, what happens is because of God and when we're abiding under the secret place, we're rescued, we're protected. Not only that, but we enjoy His presence and we are delivered. I want to pick it up today, or number His presence, and then number five today, I want to pick it up with the fact that we are delivered. We are delivered. So take a look, if you would, please, once again at verse number 15, part C. I will deliver and honor him. I will deliver him and honor him. This word delivered here in the Hebrew means, means far above dangers which plague the world. Hold your finger here. Go to Isaiah, if you would, 43. Isaiah 43. It's a promise that you can claim. Our friend Dick Mills has ministered often to our church. And Dick says there's probably about 7,000 promises in the Bible or thereabouts. Here's one of them that you and I can claim as redeemed people of God in covenant relationship with the Lord. Isaiah 43 verse 1 says this, But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel. You can put your own name in there. You could say, He who created you, Don. He who formed you, Jim, I have summoned you by name. You are mine, Luann. Here's what he says in verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Why? He says, I promise to deliver you. It doesn't mean you may not go into some fire. Fire refines. Fire can be heated up. But he says, when you go into that thing, I'm going to be there right in the middle with you. And it reminds me of Daniel chapter 3, the story of the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. My wife corrected me last week. She says, you assumed something. I said, what was that? That all these people understand these stories that you talk about, these Bible stories. She says, you know what? It ain't so anymore because not everybody went to Sunday school. So don't assume that everybody you're talking to understands these stories and have heard them. I've heard them growing up in Sunday school. They're powerful truths of the living Word of God. And this one in Daniel is the story where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what happens is their names actually had been changed from Hebrew names. They've been given Babylonian names that are the counterpart thereof. And what happens, there's a day that Nebuchadnezzar, he says, then his satraps come and say, hey, listen, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the man. Let's have a whole time where we bring everybody together in the plains of Dura. Let's worship you. Let's set up a statue in your honor, 90 feet tall. We're going to all come together and we're going to worship you. And we're all going to bow down. And if anybody doesn't do it, then they get thrown in the fire furnace. He goes, sounds like a plan. Let's bring everybody in. He just assumed everybody was going to bow down. However, he forgot that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel, they served a different God. They marched to the beat of a different drummer. Let me tell you something. i got to tell you something. And Christianity is counterculture. It doesn't run concurrent with culture. You are part of a different kingdom. It's called the different, it's called the kingdom of God. Settle it, understand that, and realize that you march to the beat of a different drummer. You just don't follow the dictates of culture. That wherever culture goes, wherever the river of culture takes you, doesn't mean that you have to participate in that because you're part of a different culture. It is the culture of the kingdom of God. And so these guys says, hey, buddy, we aren't bowing down. So they come, they bring everybody together, hundreds of thousands of people, the plain of Dura, the statue set up, and then what they go. And have you ever heard of the, black, uh, the, uh, the burning man out in the desert, Black Rock, uh, black Rock Nevada? It happens every year in Black Rock, Nevada. Hundreds of thousands of people come from all over the place. They set up a great big statue. It's called the Burning Man. And on the final day, they burn it down. Now, uh, leading up to this, what they all do is they sell their wares. It's kind of a whole new agey thing. So they have new age booths. People run around naked if they want. It's a free for all. No, it's true. It's serious. Time Magazine did an article on it some years ago. So it's a, it's a, it's a gigantic free for all. So what happens then is on this last day, they put this great big Burning Man statue up and they burn it as an effigy and it burns. And they're just, yeah, they cheer and carry on. Well, it reminds me much like this pagan rite that's happening back here where they're worshiping Nebuchadnezzar. And in reality, how many of you know you can only worship one God? 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God with thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus himself said you can only worship one God. You cannot worship multiple gods. Settle it. There's not many ways to God. There's only one way to God. It's through the Son, Jesus Christ. If you agree with that, say amen. Amen. Okay. So here's what happens. The day comes. The band's there. They strike up the band. Everybody falls out worshiping this 90-foot statue they've built, except for three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They stand and say, no, we march to the beat of a different drummer. We're not bowing down. We're not going to worship that. So what happens, the king's ticked off. These are some of his lead guys. He brings them and says, listen, I'm going to give you another shot at this because you're embarrassing me. You're making me look bad. You're going to bow down. And he says, no, we aren't king. We honor you. We respect you in your position. However, we will not bow down. He says, I'm going to give you one more chance. And then we're going to heat the fiery furnace up seven times hotter. So what happens is they give him one more chance. They don't bow. So he says, king says, all right. Turn up the fiery furnace, heat it up seven times hotter. You all know the story. I'm talking about being delivered, folks, from the fire. When you go through the fire, he's going to be right there with you. When you go through the waters, he's going to be with you. When the troubles and trials come, God is going to go with you and go through, and you're going to come out the other side victorious. So they say, listen, king, it doesn't matter. If we die, we're going to die, and we're going to be with the Lord. If we live, we're going to live unto him. It does not matter. We don't give a rip what you say. We don't give a rip, America, what you say about what we should do or shouldn't do. We're going to worship the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So they, once again, they, they give him the opportunity. They don't bow down. They pick him up and says, put the fire seven times hotter. When they march him up to the fiery furnace and they throw them in fully clothed, turbans on their head, their clothes on, they throw and they fall into the fiery furnace. They, this in the Bible, this is what the Bible says. It records it. It says the guys that threw them in, they got so close, they died because of the heat of the fiery furnace. These guys stumble in, and they stand up. Here's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they're standing up in the fiery furnace. And all of a sudden, Nebuchadnezzar is sitting on his throne. Picture him on his throne, his big hairy beard, his big kingly hat on his head. And as he's sitting there, he's sitting there watching, and he's watching, and these guys stumble in. And he goes, ah! I thought I only threw three guys into the furnace, but there's a fourth in the fiery furnace that looks as if unto the Son of God. It was a theophany. It was an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament that when they went through the fire, he was with them in the midst of it. He delivered them out of it. He says, bring him out, bring him out, bring him out. They brought him out, and it says there, their clothes did not smell of fire. Their hair was not singed. There was absolutely nothing on them that indicated they'd been thrown into a fire furnace. You can't go camping and play around the fire without coming away and smelling like smoke. You can't be around somebody smoking a cigarette or a cigar. And you go, you've been smoking? Because of the smell. These guys didn't smell like smoke. Nebuchadnezzar says, their God is the true God, the true and the living God. I believe we're moving into a time when the church has to be the church. We can't follow the dictates and the patterns of the culture around us. We follow the dictates and the culture of the kingdom of God. Do I hear an amen? Because when we do, he delivers us. He brings us out of the swamp of despair, out of oppression, depression, sickness, disease, infirmity, financial disaster. God wants to bring us out. Do I hear an amen? He wants to deliver us. Hallelujah. I'll move on. Number six in our teaching. <laughs> number two today, but number six. This goes back to the text. He says, not only will I deliver him, but I will honor him. I will honor him. You see, the man who honors God with his love and willingness, his willingness to forsake the world will ultimately be honored by God. How many of you know, Jesus says, if you acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. If you acknowledge me before men... I'll acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. See, some people, they want to act like, you know, they're closet Christians or something. Hey, listen, you can't be a closet Christian. Right. It's amazing to me, everybody, well, I'm coming out. They come out gay, they come out lesbian, they come out this, they come out that. How about we stand up and be counted for? Are you with me, saints? I'm not. You read it a moment ago. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and the salvation of men, to the Jew first and the Gentile second. That's what Paul said. That's what we need to be saying. I'm not ashamed to be lined up with Christ and to be known as, as his son or his daughter. I'm not embarrassed by that fact. In fact, I'm proud of that fact. You've all heard my stories about just letting my light shine wherever I go, wherever I'm doing. I just believe in letting my light shine. I've been that way all of my life. It's just characteristic because I believe the word, and so therefore I live the word. I was sitting in the sauna some months ago, probably after a workout, and we were hanging out Tuesdays and Thursdays at our gym is, is sauna day, so we like it. So after workouts, we go and hang out in the sauna for a little bit and see the boys that are in there and chit-chat and everything else, but it's a great opportunity to minister. There's a guy in there, I'll just 
say his name is Bruce and leave it at that. Bruce has, by the way, periodically watched the television program. I hope he's watching today. Bruce, by the way, there's a seat for you and your wife, just like I promised you right here on the front row. Amen. But Bruce, some years ago, or some years ago, some months ago, actually probably about eight months ago now, found out that he had contracted a tumor, a cancerous tumor in his jaw. And, and so he was sitting there, and he was filled with despair, and he says, man, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I looked at him, and I said, you're going to make it. You're going to live. You're not going to die, and you're going to make it through this thing. I'm going to lay hands on you right in a sauna, sweat pour, and we prayed for him as you're going to live. He went later. We didn't see him again for months and months and months and months. Well, Bruce went away, and he had, had this thing cut out, had some chemo and everything. And unbeknownst to me, the doctors had given him an absolute clean bill of health. Lost, lost 60 pounds. Looks fantastic, by the way. And, and, he, and one day that I wasn't there, he told my partner, he says, hey, listen, just I want you to tell John that I, he, his words are right. I did live. I am alive. I am, I am well. So then I got to see him here a couple of weeks ago. He told me the story himself, and I just rejoiced. And I says, and by the way, we have that seat for you. He says, I got to come by there and find, I got to come by and see you in person. So you're, not, you're one of those hellfire and brimstone preachers, aren't you? He said, I go, well, I preach strong, but I always preach grace in the favor of the Lord. But see, that's once again the fact that we honor the word and God will honor his word. So I believe honoring happens in a lot of dimensions of life. You know, there's not a lot of honor anymore. People don't honor people. People disrespect people. Kids disrespect their parents. I'd like to just slap some kids sometimes. <laughs> Can I be honest? Yep. They should be slapped. The dishonor with their parents, the way they treat their parents, it's ridiculous. Here's a, let me just read this. Go with me to the book of, go with me to the book of uh, uh, first, first Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. <laughs> Forgot where it was. There it is. 1 Samuel, chapter 2, verse 30. We all heard of little Samuel? Yep. <laughs> Who heard the Lord? In 1 Samuel, chapter 2, verse 30, here's what it says. Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promised that the members of your family would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. Those who honor me, I will honor. But those who despise me will be disdained. See, the problem was Eli, who now is the prophet of God, that Sam was being mentored by, his kids are a mess. He let them get out of hand. He didn't discipline. He didn't correct them. And if you've been around me at any length of time, I just believe you ought to, parents, you have a responsibility to train your kids. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way they should go. When they're old, they're not depart from it. I believe you have a responsibility to be your kid's parent, not your kid's friend. There'll come a time when they become adults, you'll be friends then. But right now, you're their parent, and you must parent them. That means, that means correction needs to come. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, I'm meddling right now, but I'm going to just keep right on going down the road. In Hebrews, chapter 12, where it talks about discipline, that God loves. In other words, you know you're, you're a son or a daughter of His because you get, you get discipline. The word there is, is child train is the word discipline. It means to child train. Child train doesn't mean you always get slapped upside the head. It doesn't mean you always get swatted on the bottom. Child train means that you're training them. It is a process. If you don't treat, train a kid how to brush their teeth, they're going to go up and their teeth are going to fall out of their head. If you don't train a kid how to work and have a work ethic, they're not going to learn how you put them at a disadvantage in life. But you're, you did that. If you don't correct your kids, then what happens is you have an expectation they're going to go to preschool. Preschool is going to have difficulty with them. You go to grade school, grade school is going to have a difficulty with them. You're going to go to high school and it just keeps passing the buck until they're in juvie. And then from juvie, it's the state pen. Why? Because you didn't take the time to train them when they were kids growing up. Training begins the moment they come out of the chute, if I can be as plain and bold as that. Now, that doesn't mean that even then they may turn and go a different direction. I've seen that happen where parents have done everything that they knew to do to bring them up and their parents, the kids just went sideways. Why? Because we all have a choice. I'm not condescending or condemning anybody. Are you hearing me? I'm here for your victory. I'm here for them, I'm here for them to be, I'm here for those kids to be the men and women of God that God's ordained them to be. Do I hear an amen? amen. 
So you got to call the destiny, the gold in your kids forth. You got to believe in them. You got to speak to that. Say you're a man and a, you're, gonna, you're a man or a young woman of God. You got to call forth the blessing on them. You got to call your kids blessed. You got to say that you're going to marry godly, godly spouses. For my son John Mark, who's there today, who celebrates his birthday today. He's 26 years young today. What happened is, is that when the when when he was in his mother's womb, I would kneel down to his mother's womb. I would prophesy. I say, you're going to come forth and you're going to marry a godly woman and you're going to have godly children and you're going to raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Guess what? He married a godly woman and the godly parents are sitting right here today because we prayed for that to happen. I'm sure they prayed for their daughter to marry godly, a godly son uh, as well or a godly man, there you go, as well. And that they would have godly kids and they would be trained up in the way of the Lord. See, we can set into motion. The Bible says in the book of Exodus, it says in Exodus chapter 20, it talks about the sins of the father are passed on to the third and fourth generation. But it says blessing to the thousandth generation of those that love him are called according to his purpose. It's time to shift America. And it's not going to happen by placards. It's not going to happen by protest. What's with the knotheads in New York City? Give me a break. It's got to happen in the heart. The change has to happen in the heart. That's why they got to be born again. When they're born again, they have a shift in their heart. They have a shift in their mindset. And they begin to walk in the principles of the kingdom. And then they begin to act like the redeemed of the Lord that say so. See, because unbelievers are lost. All they know how to do is sin. So when they sleep around or they drink or they do drugs or whatever they do, all they're doing is they're saying, I'm looking for something to fill that void in my life. And it can only be found when they find Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. So you know what? You can't condescend and condemn them. Oh, you no good, dirty, rotten sinner. They already know that. Amen. Give them a break. You need to call them into their eternal purpose and destiny. I see you as a man or a woman of God serving the Lord Jesus Christ, going to church, plugged in, giving of your time, energy, and resources of the kingdom of God. Call forth that which you believe over. Not what they already are. It takes no, it takes no prophetic word to see what's already there. Come on, I'm preaching better than you're amening right now. We're talking about honor. We need to show honor to one another. Sometimes I think within our culture, we, we so epitomize youth that we neglect the wisdom of the elderly in our midst. We brush them aside. They're non-plus. They have nothing of value to give, when in reality they have great wealth of information to draw upon. I praise the Lord for the men of God that I've been able to, in my lifetime, bring around me, whether through biographies or in person. I think of Dick Mills every time he's ever come. I've spent as much time with Dick as possible. We'll go to lunch and we'll be sitting there at lunch or breakfast and Dick will sit down there. You know, he's 80. When, last time he was here, he was like 87 or something like that. And he sits like this and he's like, you know, you can sit like this. We'll sit down to eat. And his, t his, 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 his basically his stomach becomes his table. And he'll be eating. Food will fall all over him. But he's talking to me. So I'm like a good son. I reach up and I, you know, I wipe him off and I, I dust him off. That's honor. I honor the wealth of information. I ask him every question Amen. imaginable that I can because the man is a wealth of knowledge. T.L. Osborne, when he was with us for two days straight, man, he was in my car. I was in his hotel room. T.L.'s touched the nations, everybody. He's preached to thousands upon thousands all over the world. When you get around somebody, you honor the gift. You honor the gift in them. We have got to become better at honoring people recognizing them. We need to honor people that are in the body of Christ. Honor the fivefold ministry. Honor the gifts in our midst. Everybody is gifted on some level. We must honor them for what God's done in their life. David honored King Saul. Write this down. I won't go there for the sake of time. You can just jot it down. 1 Samuel 26, 22 through 25, that even when Saul wanted to take his life, he said, I will not lift my finger against the Lord's anointed. He honored and respected the man, even though the man went sideways, went off the rails. He says, I'm not going to touch him. God will take care of it. God will take care of it. And he honored him in that respect as the king over the nation of Israel. Quickly, number seven. Go back to the, sounds like the kids are having fun. That's awesome. I like it. Go to verse 16. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Long life, long life. You see, this promise is in marked contrast to the apparent despair of the preceding psalm, which describes long life as labor and sorrow in Psalms 90, verse 10. I mean, a life shouldn't be a drudgery. Life ought to be fun. 
Exodus 20, verse 12, Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 3. You can jot this down. Go look at it later. But it talks about one of the keys to long life, and it goes back to my previous statement, is children, obey your parents that you might have long life in the land which I'm giving you. Long life. Because what I said earlier about kids, if they don't obey their parents... Because God's placed authority in, in all of the realms of society. If you don't face it here, you're going to face it here. Face it here, you won't face it there. And if you don't face it there, you're in jail. And it's unfortunate. Our jails are filled with people that never, and unfortunately because maybe it was a single parent household, daddy abandoned them, all those kinds. I understand that. But my point is this, is that obedience really is a key to long life. There's something about long life there. In 1972, NASA launched the Exploratory Space Probe Pioneer 10. According to Leon Joffrey in the Time magazine, the satellite's primary mission was to, teach, was to reach Jupiter, photograph the planet and its moons, and beam data to the Earth about Jupiter's magnetic field, radiation belts, and atmosphere. Scientists regarded this as a bold plan, for at that time no Earth satellite had ever gone beyond Mars, and they feared the asteroid belt would destroy the satellite before it could reach its targets. Stay with me. The Pioneer 10 accomplished its mission and much more. Swinging past the giant planet in November 1973, Jupiter's immense gravity hurled Pioneer 10 at a higher rate of speed toward the edge of the solar system. At 1 billion miles from the sun, Pioneer 10 passed Saturn at some 2 billion miles. It hurtled past Uranus, Neptune at nearly 3 billion miles, Pluto at almost 4 billion miles. By 1997, 25 years after its launch, Pioneer 10 was more than 6 billion miles from the sun. And despite that immense distance, Pioneer 10 continued to beam back radio signals to scientists on Earth. Perhaps most remarkable, writes Joffrey, was that those signals emanate from an 8-watt transmitter, which radiates about as much power as a bedroom nightlight, okay? And takes more than nine hours to reach the Earth. The little satellite that could was not qualified to do what it did. In fact, engineers, uh, engineers had designed Pioneer 10 with a useful life of just about three years, but it kept going and going. I think I can, I think I can, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. By simple longevity, its tiny 8-watt transmitter radio accomplished more than anyone thought possible. So it is when we, you and me, look at somebody and say you, look at somebody else and say you, tap them on the shoulder and say you. So it is when we offer ourselves to serve the Lord, God can work even through someone with an 8-watt ability. (laughs) However, God cannot work through someone who quits. Okay? I'm going to do it. With long life, will He satisfy and show you my salvation? My grandpa, many of you know this, my grandparents on my dad's side came from Mexico, came from Leon, Guanajuato, Mexico, came to the United States of America, ended up first in Texas, then Kansas, back to, to, to Mexico, and then back across to South Dakota. Who, who had thought that you'd have Mexicans in South Dakota? But that's where I come from. My dad was born and raised there and um, spoke Spanish before he did English, simultaneously, actually. My, by the way, my grandparents and my oldest uncle, they became United States citizens, just so you know that. Took the Pledge of Allegiance, all that kind of good stuff. Another story. Let's go on. But anyway... <laughs> One of the things that my dad remembers my grandpa doing was this. When they would go to bed at night, he would sit out in a chair in the living room. All the kids were in bed. They had kids, 12 kids in their family. Every night, he'd open the Bible. He'd read the Bible out loud to the entire family. They would hear it. He said he'd sit there at night reading the Bible out loud. Everybody in the house would hear it. With long life will I satisfy you. My grandpa lived to be six months shy of 100 years of age. I was actually privileged to join in his uh, ceremony. When it, was a, it was a Catholic church. Catholic priest did his part. Then I preached a full-on sermon and gave an altar call. About six, seven people gave their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. So my greatest preaching is in, in funeral services. I always give an opportunity for people to get born in my funeral services. Amen. And people almost always get born again. You guys have been around. You know what? It's true. Right. Anybody that's been involved with me in my funeral services, I preach the gospel at some point and people get born again. I believe part of why he lived to that ripe old age is because he ate cilantro and he ate chili and all that. No, is because of the Word of God. Declaring the Word out loud. It's health to your entire being. There's something about the spoken Word that's delivered out of your mouth that just brings long life. Quickly and lastly, I will show you my salvation. That's what he says in verse 16. And show him my salvation. 
You see, to see the salvation of God is to see beyond today and to know that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us according to Romans 8, 18. We all know that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for it is grace you've been saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Huh? Yeah. So, again, Ephesians 2, 8. It is not by works, but it's through faith. It's by grace through faith that we're born again. That's what Ephesians 2, 8 says. That's how salvation comes. So my point is this. That word in the, in the New Testament is the word sozo. It means salvation spiritually. It means salvation Physically, and it means salvation, soul realm, which is deliverance. It's in all three realms. It's spirit, soul, and body. God delivers us in all three realms. He says, with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. I'm telling you, God wants to heal you up. If you have emotional baggage that you've carried for years, God wants to bring you to a point that you're healed of that. If you've been molested as a kid growing up, I don't care if you're a girl or a boy. Nowadays, we're just amazed at the kind of stuff that's uncovered. Before, you never heard about it, but now you hear about it. There's so much crap that's out there that kids have gone through. Because of stupid people that have been manipulated by the enemy to predicate upon them. Let me just say something. That wasn't God. That was the enemy working through that individual. Did God know about it? Yes, he did. Did he love you in the midst of it? Yes, he did. But somebody took advantage of you. And I'm here to declare to you that God wants you to be whole. He wants you to be set free from the damaged emotions of whatever trauma or pain that you experienced as a kid growing up. You need to hear this today. Young men and young women and, and, and adults that are now older adults, but you went through that as your life. And you said, wow, how could this happen? Let me tell you something. God loves you. He loves you. And he wants you to be free from that damaged emotion that he can put it right and make you whole to the glory of God. He wants you whole in every dimension that you don't have to be in bondage to any addiction, that you can be free. Amen. We all know the word says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. For it's with the mouth that man confesses, with the heart he believes. So there's something significant about the salvation that God wants all of humanity, but it's a choice. you got to choose. He wants us to have a long life. I believe physical life. And I don't mean broken down life. I don't mean, oh, I'm struggling around, you know. I just believe, go to bed, go to sleep, go to heaven. Live to be 120, go to bed, go to sleep, go to be with Jesus until, unless he comes before that. Then we're going to the rapture. Praise God. You see, in Jesus Christ, our redemption, protection, and answers to prayer, we get to experience his presence and rehabilitation. There are also long life, eternal life, and the showing of God's salvation. For this very reason, we can safely say that whoever does not make God his refuge is a fool. If you don't make God your refuge, you're a fool. The Lord assures us that his own will enjoy themselves as his children in this life and the life to come. Several years ago, a man and woman were found frozen to death in their car. A blizzard had dumped tons of snow in the area, burying their vehicle. Before she died, the woman scribbled a note on a piece of paper and stuffed it in the glove compartment. The note read this, I quote, I don't want to die this way. Tragically, less than six feet from their icy grave was a stranded bus whose festive passengers remained warm throughout the night, enjoying the heat because the diesel just kept running. Six stinking feet away, and they could have got through and got there and found safety and salvation. See, salvation is so close to everybody. Amen. It's available. As I read that, I was reminded of a friend of mine who lives in Southern California. His mother-in-law is up in years. Cancer has riddled her body, gone through everything that doctors can do, and they say, there's really nothing more we can do. He said something to me the last time that he was up here that just rocked my world. She says, she says I want to live. Here's a woman that's an elderly woman, sick in body, and says, I want to live. I want to live. I said, man, there, something leapt up in me. He says, I'm praying for her. Because that's the indomitable spirit that every believer needs. I want to live. Think about it. Larry Hagman just came out, 80 years of age, has cancer. Had a liver transplant. That's, that's pretty cool. Now he's got cancer, and he still wants to live. I just think there's something within people. We want to live. Yes. Amen. Jesus says, I've come to give you life, John 10, 10, and that life, how? More abundantly. Super minnow. Super minnow. Hooper minnow. It means to be super abundant. That's the kind of life that God wants us to live. He wants us to live that kind of life. I'm here to declare to everybody listening to me in any capacity that God wants you to live life on His terms for His glory and for His honor.